Hello and welcome to Living Words, Scripture and Tradition, brought to you by your Catholic friends and neighbors of the Diocese of Biloxi. I'm Father Joe Delatuso, your host. The past few times that we've been together, as you know, we've been systematically working through the Ten Commandments, those most fundamental of all of our Judeo-Christian beliefs, and trying to, as it were, peel away the surface understanding we have of the Ten Commandments and look at so many of the implications that so often get lost in the shuffle when we're thinking about whether we are people who abide by the Ten Commandments or who don't. The last time we were together, we looked at the Seventh Commandment, You Shall Not Steal, and you remember that I was saying that what is really so insidious about stealing is not only that it deprives someone of something which is legitimately theirs, but that because our whole society is supposed to be based upon honesty, which is the value behind the Seventh Commandment, no matter how insignificant or minor taking the thing I take is of, in cost or value, nevertheless I'm chipping away at that underlying fabric of society. And so in a sense there's no such thing as stealing something small or taking something insignificant. If the individual value of what I take is small, nevertheless the very fact that I'm chipping away at the fabric of society, the, the value of honesty that is supposed to be in society, makes that into something which we all need to be aware of. Well the same thing is true of the Eighth Commandment that we're going to be looking at today. It's in that same kind of vein. You see it here on your screen, the Eighth Commandment, which says, you shall not bear dishonest or false witness against your neighbor. Now, right off the bat, when we usually think of that, the, the sin, as it were, or the violation of that commandment that usually comes to our mind is perjury, because not only are you telling a lie, but then you are consciously and intentionally swearing by God that what you're saying is the truth. So I suppose perjury would be the... the paramount example of breaking the Eighth Commandment. But again, I think we would be doing a disservice to the Eighth Commandment if we just went on our way and say, well, I've never perjured, I've never done anything that gross, that, that, that's important to, to break the Eighth Commandment. I think, just as with the Seventh Commandment, we have to look with Father McBride at the value that underlies the Eighth Commandment and ask ourselves, are we violating that value even though technically we might not be perjuring ourselves? The value that Father McBride points out to us that underlies the Eighth Commandment is the value of truth, of integrity, in other words, of being genuine, of, of recognizing the fact that what you see is what you get. I'm not a person of duplicity. I'm not double standard. The truth is something which is a part and parcel not only of me, but of our society. And that's why even telling a small lie, quote unquote, something of insignificant importance, nevertheless has a, does have an importance because once again it's tearing away at the fabric that underlies our society. Take a look for instance at what is truth or how does truth stack up as it were in scripture. Well anyone who knows the little, least little bit about scripture realizes that truth is something which is just paramount in God's view. Just as honesty is something and trust are something which our whole society is based upon, our, our relationship with God is, is based upon our trusting and being able to trust God and take him at his word, so also our whole society, if we're made in God's image, must be based upon our belief that God is true, that it, there is not anything of duplicity or falsehood about him. He wouldn't be God if he, was, if he was false, if he was a schemer or a liar. I mean, just putting those two concepts together sort of makes you cringe a little bit. By definition, God is truth. In fact, when Jesus is, is, is talking to his disciples in John's Gospel, he doesn't say, I am the one who has truth. He doesn't just say, I want to tell you about truth. He identifies himself with truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. So in other words, truth is something which is identifiable with God. It's, it's something that defines who He is. He is the one who is truth. 
Therefore, if we break truth, maybe in what we might consider insignificant ways, a little white lie, for instance. How many times have you heard people say that? Well, I'm just going to tell a little white lie. Or I'm just going to say something what well, isn't exactly earth-shattering. It's just a small lie. Well, in and of itself, we might judge it that way. But again, when you reflect upon scriptures, revelations telling us that God is truth, then all of a sudden you see, can see the importance that the Eighth Commandment takes on for all people. It, we can see this in our society today. I mean, if we're willing to make distinctions and say, oh, well, some truth is more important than others, then perhaps we can begin to understand why there seems to be a vacuum in our society uh, about telling the truth. I mean, we, we hear a, a parent, for instance, tell an eight-year-old, uh, tell the man I'm not home now, and then wonder why when the child is 14 or 15 years old, he or she is lying to the parents about what they're doing or where they're going or where, who, they're, who they've been with. Or, for instance, we hear an employer say to one of his employees, listen, the inspector's coming around, just tell him everything is okay, even though the safety requirements aren't exactly being followed. Just, just tell him that so that we can get rid of him, and then wondering why his employee turns around and is walking off in his lunch bucket with all sorts of electronic parts or bricks or whatever else it is he happens to be working with. Truth is a kind of a thing which, unless we hold it up as a value that we respond to in all areas, we begin to chip away at it, and pretty soon it's easy for us to be undergirding the very fabric of our society. We don't, since we, we allow lies in some areas, we don't know who to believe anymore. We don't know what is truthful. And so one of the beliefs about telling the truth is that Truth in the long run is its own reward, whereas deception in the long run is its own punishment. We, we start to become a very cynical and a very pessimistic kind of society. We don't know who to believe, and so we start distrusting everyone. I, I, I saw this most recently in the, in the war effort where the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was giving a, a briefing to reporters. And he made the statement, someone asked him a question, he said, well, I, I can't give you that for military reasons, but trust me. And then afterwards, they had a former Secretary of Defense was on, on the program as a commentator, and the, the anchor person said to this former Secretary of Defense, do you believe him when he says, trust me? And without even hesitating, the former Secretary said, well, well, of course I don't trust him. I mean, after all, he's the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I thought to myself, what kind of a society are we living in where the heads of departments of government who are supposed to be rep representing us we can't even believe them. And notice, the, the former Secretary of Defense wasn't saying that that person was a bad person or he, he was lying because he's, a, he's some sort of a, a, a dishonest person. He was saying the role he's in calls for him to lie. And the role he's in is one of the most important in the whole military scheme of our society. Well, you know that among yourselves. I'm, I mean, how often when, when a politician, for instance, makes a statement, you'll hear someone say, oh, well, he's a politician. What do you expect him to say? That's kind of a, a symptom, I think, of what I'm talking about when I say when we begin to take truth um, in a minor way, it begins to eat away at our whole appreciation of who we are and what our society is. We, don't be, we, we start not trusting anyone. We almost go to the opposite extreme. We expect certain people to lie to us. And when you start living in a society like that, it's very easy for our society to become very pessimistic and very cynical. Notice how different that is from the way Jesus dealt with things. I mean, the, the excuse that's usually given is, well, everybody does it. That's the, way the, that's the way you play the ball game. That's the way it's done. Well, Jesus had to confront that same thing in his own lifetime, and notice what happened at his own trial. When people were coming forward lying about him, when people were coming forward making up accusations against him, he could have lowered his standards, as it were. In fact, you almost get the feeling when, when you read scripture between the lines that the Pharisees were almost expecting him to come back in kind to do the very same thing they were doing, to start lying, to defend himself, to make himself look good, not to be genuine, as it were. And, and you almost get the, a, a feeling of amazement on the part of Pilate. Well, how can this man not even defend himself? I mean, it, it, why doesn't he go along with the good old boy system? Why doesn't he do what everybody else does when they get in this kind of a situation? All I'm asking, you can see Pilate's trying to give him opportunities to get himself out of this jam. He's almost saying to him, look, just, you know, play it down a little bit. You know, you don't have to go to such extremes. You don't have to keep challenging everyone. And Jesus simply says, look, 
I can't speak for you. I can't be responsible for what you do, but I know that I have to be about my father's work. I am the truth. I have to live up to that expectation that I will always tell the truth. If you're going to kill me for that, well, then that's going to have to be on your head, not upon my, not upon my head. And so that's the kind of aspect we're dealing with when we get into this notion of, of truth and of, of deception and of lying. In fact, we see, for instance, that uh, M. Scott... Peck, who's written a number of books, The, the Road Less Traveled, and another one uh, that where he talks about the challenges of our times, wrote a book called The Children of the Lie, in which he says that, you know, so much of the, so much of the, the vacuum of our society can be traced right down to the fact that we don't trust one another. We don't tell the truth to one another, and almost we don't expect one another to tell the truth to each other that we make excuses for, for going along with the crowd, for taking the easy way out, rather than standing up and recognizing, when I am telling the truth, I am of God. And when I am telling a lie, no matter how insignificant it might seem, I am not of God. In fact, Father McBride points out, when you think about it, what was the, the cause of the first sin of our parents, Adam and Eve? It was due to a lie. Satan, in the form of a snake in the story of, of, of creation, comes to Eve and says to her, why can't you eat that, that fruit over there? And she says, well, God told us that we would die. And the serpent says to her, oh, no, you're not going to die. What God knows is you're going to become just like he is. That's why he told you not to eat the fruit. He tells a lie. And, and from that lie, of course, sin enters the world. And so we call Satan the father of lies. And, we, and that's where M. Scott Peck gets that notion, that the children of lies. We almost, as it were, inherit an atmosphere where if we're not careful, it becomes easy for us to go along and just simply be deceptive with one another, to tear at the fabric where instead of having a society based upon God's values, we, we sort of de-evolve de into the, a primitive society, a law of the jungle, a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world. We, we allow and encourage evil to take over us because we don't, we don't stand up and say, no, the truth will set us free. Maybe we don't believe that. We don't believe that, that the truth is its own reward. It brings about freedom. It, it enables us to, to hold our heads up and, and to be genuine people. So, so very often we think that, that telling the truth will get us in trouble. Well, in the short run it may because people don't like to hear the truth. But as, as Mark Twain once said, always tell the truth. It will amaze some and confound the rest of, you, of humanity. Or as someone else said, always tell the truth and you won't have to remember anything. You won't have to try to remember. And you know from your own experience, my own experience, when I've told a lie, how then I have to try to remember. Now, what did I say to this person if I'm talking to another person and, and I try and I get myself more enmeshed and more involved in the, in the lie that I'm creating and I'm, I'm creating more lies and the first thing you know, I'm, I'm almost, I'm a slave. I'm, I'm, I'm not free anymore. That's what Jesus is saying when he says that the truth will make you free. And so the Eighth Commandment, which, which forbids us or has that negative again, which tells us what not to do, is also positively holding out to us the value of truth so that we can be free people and we, don't have to, we can hold our heads up high. There are five things, you might say, or realities that the, that the Eighth Commandment forbids us to do. Five ways, as it were, by which we can be less than truthful or we can actually be deceptive. And I would like to step over to the board. I'm, I've put together a chart for you and we'll look at them one by one so that you can see for yourself uh, how over the period of time the, the Christian community has come to categorize some of the ways in which we can be deceptive with one another, some of the ways in which we can be less than truthful. And so I've, I've titled this, this uh, list as untruth, ways in which we can be less than truthful. The first one of these, as you see on your screen right here, is the way we can, we can be lying to one another or perjury. And I've already spoken about that as the, the grossest example of lying. Not only are we being untruthful, but then on top of that, we are saying we are calling God to be our witness, that we are telling the truth, even when we consciously and intentionally intentionally know that that's not happening. And I think we have to be careful when, when we 
when we look so much at our media today, who seems to be the people that, that are almost admired because they get away with things? That they're able to lie, for instance, in court and get a settlement in their favor. Or they're, they, because uh, some technicality of the law allows them to, to come off scot-free, as it were, even though everyone knows that, that they have not told the truth. And we almost sort of say, well, that's the way you do it. That's, that's sort of an, almost an envy about being able to do that. Uh, so often in, in, in our world today, we're lawyers who are supposed to be the advocates of the people, are supposed to defend the rights of the people. So often we almost wink and, and smile when some lawyer is able by trickery to, to deceive people into thinking that his client deserves what he's getting or, or doesn't deserve what, the, what, he, sh what he should get. I, I think we have to begin to call people to be people of integrity, people of genuineness, that we don't in any way serve the, the purposes of untruth. I mean, we even talk about it in wartime, don't we, that the first victim of, of warfare is truth. Uh, and, and I gave you that example of the head of the, the, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, getting up there and no one believing what he's saying because everybody expects him to tell a, a, a lie. And it gets so ridiculous that it even flows over into areas like the weather. We can't even tell what the weather is now. We don't expect people to give us a weather report that's accurate because, well, that's somehow going to be aiding our enemy. So you can see, I think that's the point of, of M. Scott Peck's how insidiousness lying and falsehood could be. It, it begins to spill over into everything and to pervert all sorts of other areas that really, normally speaking, wouldn't even be affected by that. That Just the way that falsehood can do that, of course, as Christians and as Judeo inheriting a Judeo-Christian tradition, what we want to say is by being truthful, although in the short run, as it happened with Jesus, we may have to stand up and face some unpleasant music, that in the long run, it's the only way we can build the kind of a society that we want our children and grandchildren and future generations to live in. That the kind of a society where everybody is pessimistic and cynical and distrustful of one another and dishonest with one another, that that's a jungle that we don't want for ourselves or for those who are going to come after us. Well, the second way that we can also promote untruth, as you'll see here on your screen, is by cheating. In a sense, cheating is, is putting lying into action. And again, I think we have to be careful when we're talking with our children or when we reflect on our own lives. We say, oh, well, it really didn't amount to very much. I just, I just cheated on one answer on my test. And, you know, when we, when we put in that smaller scope, we might be able to shrug our shoulders and say, well, it wasn't what we should have done, but it isn't all that terrible. I think what I'm trying to show you is there's an insidiousness about cheating, about lying, about falsehood that begins to tear away at the very fiber of our society. A good example was in the recent Olympics that we witnessed. Uh, so very often we hold up the athletes and, and, and kids themselves hold up the athletes as, as role models and, and we try to say, look, with hard work and determination and using your God-given abilities, you can succeed, you can be someone, you can, you can attain to the goals that you set for yourself. And then we had that tragic situation where the Canadian Ben Johnson, who, who broke the world's record in the 100-meter dash, was found to be on steroids. And the, the letdown, not, not only for himself, I mean, imagine having to, to look in the mirror every day and realize that you've been singled out, you've been identified as someone who has cheated, who has, who has lied to the entire world. But then on top of that, all of the kids who must have looked to him as a role model, and now how do their parents explain to them that, well, we don't want you to be like that person. We don't want you to be someone who goes around and, and attains things by, uh, by cheating, by lying, and, and buying a, a, by being a distrustful person. I, I want to show you something on the board here which, which uh, maybe might be a reminder to you when you see this word in the future. Our, our English word sincere comes from two Latin words, sine and chera. And what it literally means is without wax. This is where our word sincere comes from, without wax. And what that goes back to is into the Greek and Roman days, when a sculptor wanted to, to, to sculpt a statue, he would go out to the quarry and he would pick out and purchase the piece of marble or granite that he was going to sculpt with. Well, because marble and granite isn't always perfect, and sometimes there might be some faults in there that, that would mean that if a, a sculptor hit it with a chisel, it might just fracture the whole piece or slide it off and it would ruin his sculpture. 
and also because there were some dishonest quarry masters, what they would do is if they would find a piece of marble or if they would find a piece of granite that was almost perfect but maybe had one flaw in it, they would take wax and they would melt the wax down into the crevice and fill up the space and then cover it over with a little bit of dirt and make it look as though the piece of marble, the piece of granite was, uh, was whole and was valuable. The, the sculptor would take it, would go home and soon start chiseling on it. Once he hit that fault, the whole thing would disintegrate and fall apart. And so in order to uh, assure sculptors uh, that they were legitimate quarry masters and they didn't use these cheating and lying techniques, whenever they found a piece of marble and whenever they sold it, they would write sine chera on it. Without wax, this piece of this is a genuine block. This is this is something that you can count on. This piece of marble has integrity, and so our human word sincere comes from that notion, that that I'm a sincere person. I'm genuine. I'm a person of integrity. I'm not a saint. I'm not perfect yet. I have my own flaws, my own faults, but I'm struggling with them. I'm working with them. I'm I'm trying to overcome them. I'm neither smug enough to sit back and say, well, I'm perfect and therefore if you, if you say something small about me, I'm going to have to attack you or, or defend myself or make myself out to be some perfect person that I know I'm not going to be, nor am I some person who says, oh, well, I'm just a doormat, I'm not worth anything. I do have value. I do have God-given gifts and abilities, but I'm still on the journey. I'm still on the way. I'm not perfect yet, but I am sincere. I'm dealing with you. You can count on my word. You can trust me. You can know that I'm someone that isn't going to be two-faced with you. And so I think that's that notion of, of cheating. When, when we cheat with people or in our dealings with people, when we lie to them, we are being less than sincere. We are being two-faced. We are, we are not giving forth of our own. And we, 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 we then give in to this notion of deception and we permeate that throughout our society so that people don't know who to trust. So that's why cheating is something. No matter how small the individual thing is we might cheat of, it's that broader scope of what it does to our trusting one another that is really at the heart of the Eighth Commandment. The third way in which we can be untruthful with one another, as you see on your screen right here, is that we can also gossip. Now, you might, this might sound kind of small and people say, oh well, a little bit of gossip, you know, you're telling the truth, aren't you? Yes, you're telling the truth, but you're using the truth to tear down a person or to minimize a person, to make a person smaller or to, to introduce a, 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 a something in, for a person that we would not want to be like that person or emulate that person. We're, we're tearing down a person's reputation or, or what they, they, how they deserve to be thought of. And so notice that in this area, sometimes you can use the truth to bring about a bad end. You can use it for the wrong purposes. The purpose of truth is so that we can be sincere with one another and deal with one another as, as mature human beings, not to punish one another or tear one another down. So gossip, although it might be minor at surface value, again, it's this introducing this kind of insidious, this kind of disease of falsehood and, and rancor and backbiting and going behind people. And that's what we try to eliminate from our society so that we can have a healthy and holy society that the, that the commandments and the Jesus call for in his preaching and when he says, I am the truth. Can you imagine Jesus going around gossiping about people, trying to tear someone down? He, he stood for everything that was opposite of that. He stood for, for treating people with dignity and, and with trust and respect, not for tearing them down and making them seem small in other people's eyes. The fourth way that we can be untruthful with one another is what we call slander. And what this is is just simply telling falsehoods about one another to tear people down. That is, when, when we maliciously tell something about a person that we know is false, or maybe a half-truth. Rarely will we tell something, if we know it's important enough, it can be checked out. Rarely will we tell something about someone that's, that's totally false. But we'll put it and couch it in such a way that it's either unfalse or because it's only part of the truth, we are intentionally trying to tear someone down. It's that sort of law of the jungle notion again, that I don't want anybody to get ahead of me. I'm going to claw at them. I'm going to pull them back. I don't want anybody to seem more important or, or better than I am. Rather than respecting 
the way God created society, that all of us are different, we all have our different skills and abilities, we all have to first of all know ourselves, recognize what our abilities are, and then rather than being jealous or envious of someone else because they have a gift, I should be able, I should be able to, in all honesty, say, well, that's great, isn't it great that God gives us all different gifts? St. Paul always talks about that notion of building up the body of Christ. We all have different gifts, not so that we can lord it over one another, so that we can contribute to the health of the entire body. Body. And then the last way that we can be untruthful with, with each other is a, a strange English word. It's called calumny. Calumny. And what calumny is, is telling the truth all right, but couching it or taking it out of context in such a way that it really doesn't have anything, it isn't applicable to the situation. And we, we tell the truth not because it sheds any light on what, what we need to know right here and now, but so that we can somehow we can somehow put someone down that by using the truth, taking it out of context or bringing it in when it doesn't really apply, we can hurt another human being. Remember Jesus' own trial for a good example of this. You remember that someone came forward, a witness came forward and said, this man says that if, he, if you tear down the temple, he'll rebuild it in three days. Well, it's true. Jesus had said that. And it's true, he was going to do that. But by taking it out of context and not explaining totally what he meant by that and what he was, what he was av uh, averring to, it made it look as though this was something bad about Jesus. Or an example in our recent human history was when Senator Tom e Eagleton was going to run for vice president. Someone found out that in his past he had spent some time in a mental institution. And although he had been totally cleared by psychiatrists, and although the, uh, the reason he was there was for a relatively minor one, uh, opponents of his brought that forward. Now, it didn't really apply anymore because, as I said, he had been cleared and he had been given a clean bill of health. But by bringing that into the picture, they literally forced him to resign. It didn't apply anymore. It was true. But they weren't bringing the truth out to further the cause of justice and truth, but to get at him, to personally tear him down. And they obviously succeeded in doing that. Uh, they brought that to bear, and even though he tried to show that it really didn't have any bearing, the very fact that it had been brought to the public attention and the fear that it generated, and, and that's what it was intended to do, made people turn against him and, and consider him to be unworthy as a, as a candidate without even looking at his other qualifications and whether or not he would have been a good candidate. So I suppose we can sum up by going back once again to St. Paul. Uh, how many times in his letters, but particularly, for instance, in the letter to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, do you see St. Paul say, stop lying, be honest with one another. Remember, you have put on a new self. What Paul is alluding to there is the baptismal ceremony whereby when a person was baptized, they would go to the pool, they would take off all their clothes, they would go down into the pool, be immersed, and when they came up, a new white garment was placed on them as a symbol of the interior change that had taken place in their spirits, in their souls. And that's what Paul is saying. Look, lying through Satan is what brought slavery into the world. It's what brought this situation of humanity where we are fighting one another and at no peace with one another or with ourselves. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has, has eliminated that. He's, he's de he has defeated the deceiver, Satan. So why are you going to go back and use the, the techniques and the ploys of the deceiver once you've been baptized? You've put on the new man. You've put on the new Jesus Christ. So act that way. Be a truthful person. That in sum, then, I think is what we're really talking about when we talk about the Eighth Commandment. Being a sincere person. That no matter how other people live and what they say, I'm responsible for being truthful myself. That's the person that God is going to ask me when he judges me. Were you a truthful person? Good day, and I'll look forward to seeing you the next time we're together. This program is a service of the Diocese of Biloxi. Any financial contribution that you would like to make so that it can continue would be greatly appreciated. You can send that contribution to the Office of Communications, the Diocese of Biloxi. Mm -hmm.